um, Patrick Kamau Kamure, and um, the one who is taking you through the advanced taxation, where I continue teaching you about the taxation of the businesses. And so far, we have been able to look at the partnership, which we said it consists of two areas, the admission and retirement of a partner during the year, and also the conversion of a partnership into a limited company. Once we are done with that, then we go to the taxation of the limited company. Now, we have been able to look at the uh, questions about the admission and retirement of a partner during the year, and also the conversion. But in the conversion, uh, we were able to only look at uh, one side of determining the taxable income, that is when you are required to use the net profit method. So how about in case where you are required to use the gross profit method? How do you about, uh, go about it? So I want us to look at a question concerning that. This question comes from uh, November. Twenty fifteen, question number three. And I want us to go through it. This is what the question says. James and Katana established a partnership business, sharing profits and losses in the ratio of three to respectively. The following is the income statement of the partnership for the year ending that 1st December 2014. We have the sales consisting of an DRI's foreign exchange gain, a capital gain on sale of shares, recovery from insurance on stock stolen, goods transferred to a branch at cost, dividend from Cali Cooperative Society, and total incomes. Then rest expenses which you have purchases, purchase of computers, partner salary, legal fee, repair and maintenance, rent and rate, interest on loan, general expenses, motor vehicle expenses, insurance, preliminary expenses, director's fee, audit fees, debenture interest, traveling expenses, and net loss. Additional information number one, the partnership was converted into a limited liability company by the name Kaka Limited on 1st October 2014. Incomes and expenses accrued evenly throughout the year unless otherwise stated. Uh, number two, purchases and sales were inclusive of VAT at the rate of 16%. Closing stock was valued at 1840000 while opening stock was at 10000 of the sales. Net of value added tax. Number four, legal fee complied uh, petition to Association of Manufacturers, Notice for Change of Business Name, Conveyance Fee for Business Premise, Stamp Duty, Negotiating a Business Loan, Recovery of Bad Debts, Signing a 100 year lease Agreement, Purchase of Partners Private Residence by James, Appeal Against Tax Arrears. Number 5, Repair and Maintenance Complied, Purchase of Furniture, Installation of Neon Sign, Designing of an Office Brock, Cost of Partitioning Office Brock, Repainting of the business premises. Number six, general expenses included registering of patent rights 64,000, flotation costs of 48,000, and negotiating costs for an additional piece of land for business expansion at 56,000. Number seven, interest on loan include interest on partners' capital of shillings 100,000, which was shared according to the profit and all sharing ratio. Required one, a statement of adjusted taxable profit or loss for the business. For the year ending that 1st December 2014. Hint, start with gross profit. B, comment on the tax position of James, Katana and the company. C, uh, citing examples, advise James Katana on two areas of tax avoidance that they could explore for the business. So, we can see in this question, we are required number one to get the statement of adjusted taxable profit loss of the business. Now, in this case, you take note that um, there is a conversion. A partnership business that was existing was converted into a limited company as per additional information number one. And from the additional information number one, we can see the partnership business lasted for a period of nine months and then the limited company three months because the conversion happened on 1st October 2014 and the year of income is ending on 31st of December 2014. So how do we go about getting the taxable income? Remember we say that conversion, we always use the gross profit method unless it is stated otherwise. Now here it is hinted that hint we start with the gross profit. Although they have hinted, they don't have to hint. Even if they haven't hint, hinted, we are supposed to use the gross profit method. When they say you start with gross profit, they mean that gross profit become one of your first income. And that does not mean that you look for gross profit somewhere and then you transfer here. No. 
what you do you have to post the sales the cost of sales you get the gross profit and then you continue from there uh, another thing that we said about the conversion is we must be able to separate the two business the period of the partnership and the period of the limited company because these are two different businesses when we are taxing them we tax them separately and differently so here we start So as we have noted, the partnership lasted for a period of nine months in that year and the limited company three months in that year. So here we are using the gross profit method. So we start with the sales. We we'll start with the sales. So we take nine over 12, three over 12 of the sales figure given is 67, 28,000. But there's something that we are told about this uh, sales. If you look at additional information number two, we are told that the purchases and sales were inclusive of VAT at the rate of 16% where applicable. So that means this sales has VAT. So this sales is at 116%. Remember when you're getting the taxable income, VAT should not be factored in anywhere. So if they have the VAT, we need to remove the VAT. So we want to get the sales without VAT. So if this is 116%, we must be willing to get the 100. So take note that we are not interested in the VAT, the 16%. No, we want the cost without VAT, the 100. So if this is 116, 100 will be what? Cross multiply, it will mean that you multiply by 100 over 116. So... 67, 28,000 times 100 divided by 116. And then this we get is 5,800,000. And then we take times 9 over 12. That gives us 43,50. And this other one is going to be 5,800,000 times times 3 over 12, which we get 14.50. Now, gross profit method after getting the sales, we normally less the cost of sales. For the cost of sales, we normally start with the opening stock, of which case in this question, the opening stock we are told in additional information number 3. Closing stock was valued at 18.40, while opening stock was 10% of sales, net of VAT. So the opening stock is 10% of the sales, net of VAT. The sales that is net of VAT does not have the VAT is 5,800,000. 5, so you take times 5,800. That translates to 580,000. And then we add the purchases. The purchases is in the income statement. The first expense actually 2842. So plus 2842,000. But we are told this one as well in additional information number two it had the VAT. So we must exclude the VAT. We do the same we did with the sales. So times 100 over 116. Let us get how much that is. So 2842,000 uh, times 100 divided by 116 give us 2450,000. And then we raise the closing stock. The closing stock is given in point 3, additional information number 3. Closing stock was valued at 18.40. So minus 18.40,000. And then also remember, 
We say that we also deduct any item that reduces the stock during the year. Do we have it? Yes. If you go to the incomes, among the incomes in the income statement, there is sales and realized foreign exchange gain, capital gain, recovery from insurance on stock stolen. It is telling you that there were stocks that were stolen. So if they were stolen, this must be deducted from here. The stolen stock was 480. Minus 480. You also have the uh, goods transfer to the branch at cost. That, remember, you are just transferring goods from one place of the business to another, from the head office to the branch. There is no impact in addition to that. Because the stocks are still within the company, the branch and the head office are one and the same thing. And there is no other item that affected the cost of goods, so we cross. And then we apportion. Don't forget to apportion. We want the 9 months, so 9 over 12. The other one, 3 over 12. So we are going to have the 580,000 uh, plus 2450,000 and then minus 1840,000 and then we minus 480,000. That gives us 710 and then we multiply by 9 divide by 12. Five thirty two five hundred and then the other one is going to be seven ten times three over twelve. That gives us one seventy seven five hundred. Mm -hmm. So, after that, we can now get the gross profit. Gross profit will be sales minus the cost of sales, in which case we have 4350,000 minus 532,500, which give us 3817. 38, 17, uh, 500. This other one is 14, 50, 000, minus 177, 500. Give us 12, 72, uh, 500. Now, that is the gross profit. And then we said once you get the gross profit you normally add other taxable so we need to go through the question determine if they are taxable operating from operation now the incomes are in the income statement after the sales where we have unrealized foreign exit gain. Unrealized foreign exit gain, we said we don't usually tax. We only tax realized or if it is silent, just realize uh, foreign exchange gain. The other one is capital gain on sale of shares. Shares are investment, so not operating. Recovery from insurance on stock stolen. We said that, that income from uh, compensation from the insurance company for stock stolen, that is supposed to be a taxable income. So we come here. Insurance compensation, we have 9 over 12, 3 over 12, of 480. Mm -hmm. So we have 9 divided by 12 times 480,000. That gives us 360. The other one is 3 over 12 of the same, 120. Mm -hmm. We continue. After the recovery from insurance on stock stolen in the income statement, there is goods transfer to a branch. 
that is not a sale. You're just moving your goods from one place of the business to another, from the head office to the branch. Nothing. Dividend from carry cooperative, that's an investment income. Here we want only the operating. After that, we have the expenses. Maybe in the additional information, you need to confirm with additional information to confirm whether you have an income. But if you look at all of them from number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there is no income whatsoever. So meaning we can now less. So we need to go through the whole question again. And especially in the income statement where expenses start, any allowable expense we deduct here. And the first expense is purchases. Now purchases we use to get the cost of sales. So it's already considered there. The other one is purchase of computer. Computer is not an allowable expense. It's a fixed asset. What we allow for computer is the way and tier. And because here we are looking at allowable expense now, way and tier should be deducted. So where and tier on computers. We take 9 over 12. 3 over 12 of 25% of 130, um, 180. So 25% of 180, that give us 45 times 9 divided by 12, give us 33, 750. The other one is 3 divided by 12 times 45,000, that give us 11 to 50. So we continue. So the next expense in line is the partner's salaries. But we said partner's salary is not allowable. It's for the partnership and it's not allowed. The other one is the legal fee. Legal fee we said is usually allowable unless it is it has additional information. It is explained further, which is the case in here. If you look at the point number four, it is saying legal fee complied, petition to association of manufacturer and the rest. So what you need to do, you may you need to post one figure here because we are to me we are to using the gross profit method now. You post another allowable expense is the legal fee. So you take nine over twelve, three over twelve of the legal expense is six eighty. Minus, because you want to remain with the expense that is allowable of the legal, just minus the non allowables the one that are not supposed to be allowable. In additional information number four, we are told, legal fee complies of petition to association of manufacturers. We had said anything paid to the trade association is allowable. Association of manufacturers, that is supposed to be an allowable expense. Then notice for change of business name. Now we said that for an expense to be allowable, it must be income generating. This one change of business name has nothing to do with the income generation. We don't allow that. So minus 64,800. Then we have the conveyance fee for business premises. We said conveyance fee is the legal cost to transfer a fixed asset. And we don't usually allow it. So we minus 72,400. Again, stamp duty. Stamp duty is a form of tax. Taxes are usually not allowable. We said that. So we minus uh, 36,600. The other one is negotiating a business loan. We had said legal cost relating to loan. Bonds and debentures are not allowed. So this one is not. So 2,800. The other one is recovery of bad debts. Recovery of bad debt, we said, is usually allowable. We said any legal cost relating to debtors and customer allowed. Then signing a 100-year lease agreement. We say that the lease up to 99 years is the one that we allow legal cost. Any above that, we don't. So this is not allowable. 128, 400. 
After that, we have the purchase of the partner's private residence. We had said that any expense relating to the partners we don't allow. This for private, for the partners, we don't allow 150. The other one is appeal against tax arrears. We had said any expense relating to tax, we don't allow. So this one is not. So minus 82. Then we cross. So whatever remains there become the allowable legal costs, which we now we apportion. So it is going to be 680,000, uh, the overall legal cost minus the non allowable 64,800, minus 72,400, minus 36,600, minus 2,800, minus 128,400. And then we minus 150,000. And then we minus 82,000. That gives us 125,000. Then we take times 9 divided by 12. And 3,750. The other one we say 3 divided by 12 of 125,000. That gives us that one to fifty. Uh -huh. Then we continue. We go back to the income statement and continue looking for allowable expenses. After that, there is repair and maintenance. Repair and maintenance is allowable expense. However, there is a point number five about it. If there is something mentioning that item, go check so that you determine if there are some parts which are not allowed. You remove them. Like it includes purchase of furniture. That's a fixed asset. Fixed asset we claim we and here. Capital allowance for furniture. Installation of neon sign. That's supposed to be we and here. Uh, designing of an office block. That's a fixed asset. That requires IBD, office block. Cost of partitioning office block. We and here. 10%. Repainting of the business premise. That is now the allowable. So we have repair. So we take 9 over 12. 3 over 12 of the overall 568,400. Remove the non boss like furniture 96,000. The other one is neon sign 60. You have the office block 140. You have the partitioning 250 that so we have 568 uh, 400 minus 96,000 minus 60,000 minus 140,000 and then we minus 250,000 so that give us 22,400 and you can take note that uh, the only expense that is allowable in number five is repair of business premise. So if you remove all the others which are not allowable, you still remain with that, the 22,400. So you can as well pick that and call it repair and maintenance and then you post it there. So we times by nine, divide by 12, which you have 16,800. And then we take the other one, which we saw is 22,400. Times 3 divided by 12, 5,600. Yeah. And then we go back to the income statement. We continue looking for allowable expense. After repair and maintenance, there is rent and rates. Rent and rates. And this one. Uh, does not have additional information. So it's all about apportioning 9 over 12, 3 over 12 of uh, 244, 600. So 9 divided by 12 times 244, 600, which we have 183, 450. The other one will be 3 over 12. 
61150 and then we continue after rent and rates interest on loan interest on money borrowed we said is our board expense so interest on loan which we take again 9 over 12 3 over 12 of the interest on loan overall is 166200 we minus if you look at additional information number 7 we are told interest on loan include interest on partners capital of 100000 which was shared according to the profit sharing ratio so in here there is interest on capital to the partners which is not allowable we said so so we remain with the remaining 166 minus 200 minus 100000 that will be 66200 then we are portion 9 divided by 12 times 66 200 Give us 49,650. The other one is the same. 3 over 12 of the same. 16,550. There. Then we continue. We go back to the income statement. After the interest on loan, we have general expenses. General expenses are allowable expenses. Nine over twelve, three over twelve of the overall general expense is nine sixty four thousand. But we must minus there is an additional information number six about the general expense, which we are told that it included registering of a patent right of sixty four thousand. Patent right cost we said is not allowable. So that need to be minus sixty four thousand. Also, flotation cost of 48,000. We said flotation cost is for the shares and it is usually for the company. So, this one we have to remove it from here. Although we said it's allowable on the company, but the figure that we want to remain with is the one we apportion, the one relating to the company and the partnership. This one needs to be taken to the partnership direct, I mean to the company directory. So, we need to first of all remove it from here, 48,000. Also, there was an additional piece of uh, cost of negotiating an additional piece of land for expansion, 56,000. That is also not allowable, a fixed asset. Then, the remaining one is the one that is going to be allowable. So, we are going to take 964,000 and then we minus 64,000 and then we minus 48,000. And then we minus 56,000. You have 796,000. Then we take uh, the figure times 9 over 12. Mm -hmm. 796,000 times uh, 3 over 12. 199,000. Deduct, deduct from there then we continue after that uh, there is the motor vehicle expenses motor vehicle expenses are, are allowable remember we say that is not the motor vehicle costs that's not a fixed it's the cost of running the motor vehicle like repair fuel and all that so that is allowable expense so motor vehicle expenses which we have 9 over 12, 3 over 12. This one does not have additional information about it, so it's all about using it the way it is, 840. So we will have 9 over 12 uh, times 840. That gives us 630. We also take the 3 over 12, that gives us 210. After that, we go back, insurance. Insurance, we said, is also a rubber expense, it's a business expense. So, insurance expense, which we have again 9 over 12, 3 over 12. There is no additional information on insurance. 
which we have 156,000. So we take 9 over 12 times 156. That gives us 117,000. And also the 3 over 12 of the same, 39,000. After that, we have preliminary expenses. We said preliminary expenses are expenses incurred before you start the business. All these expenses are not supposed to be allowable before you start preliminary, pre, before. We don't allow them, we said. The other one is director's fee. Director's fee is allowable, but it only relates to the limited company. That's what we said. Only company has directors. So director's fee, which we have, 600,000, so the whole of it come here. The other one is audit fee. Audit fee is a rubber expense and it cut across the board. It, it is for the partnership and the company. So audit fee. We have 9 over 12, 3 over 12, of 148, 200. So we have 9 over 12 of 148, 200. That gives us 111, 150. The other one is for the three months. That is 7, 0, 50. After that, we have the debenture interest. We say debenture interest is allowable. And only a company can issue debentures. So, for the company, allowable. For the company, debenture interest. We have the 60,000. The next one is traveling expenses. So, traveling expenses is usually an allowable expense. So, we'll have it here. And it cut across the board. So, 9 over 12. And 3 over 12 of the traveling 96,000. So we'll have 3 over 12 times 96,000. That will give us 24,000 here. Uh, now, this is supposed to be for this 24,000 is for the company. And for the partnership, it is going to be 9 over 12, 72,000. When we get to the end of that, it's kind of we are done with the expenses. But we need to go through the additional information for an expense that is not in the PNL and it's allowable, the one not in the PNL. So we go to the additional information. Number one, the partnership was converted into a limited liability company by the name Kaka Limited on 1st October 2014. Incomes and expenses accrued evenly throughout the year unless otherwise stated. There is no expense there. So we go to number two. Purchases and sales were inclusive of VAT at the rate of 16%. There is no expense there. The number three, closing stock was valued at 1840 while opening stock was at 10% of sales net of VAT. There is no expense. Number four, legal expense. Now, legal expense is already in the PNL, and we consider the part that is allowable by removing the non allowable parts. And in the same place, we have not seen any fixed asset that we can claim capital allowance among all those ones. There is none that is a fixed asset. So we go to number five, repair and maintenance complies. So we had seen that the repair and maintenance is allowable. However, we remove the ones that are not allowable. However, we noted that most of those items, actually all the items in repair, were fixed assets. So we don't allow fixed assets, that's why we remove them, but now we claim the wear and tear. So we claim wear and tear for furniture and fitting, which is supposed to be 9 over 12, 3 over 12 of 10% of the furniture cost 96,000. 
So we take 10% of 96,000. That gives us 9,600. Then we multiply by 9, divide by 12, 72. And then we do the same. Uh, 3 divided by 12 times 9, 600, give us 2,400. So another fixed asset in point number 5 is installation of neon sign. That require wear and tear as well. So wear and tear allowance on neon sign. Which we are supposed to have again 9 over 12. 3 over 12 of 10% of 60,000. So that we take 10% of 60. That is 6,000 times 9 over 12. That gives us 4, 5. The other one is the same. Uh, 3 over 12 times uh, 6,000. 1,500. Yeah. And we continue. Another fixed asset that we have in point 5 is the designing of an office block. For the office block, we don't claim we here. We claim industrial building deduction, IBD. So we have IBD, office block. So we have 9 over 12, 3 over 12. Of the IBD, we said, is at the rate of 10%. So 10% 10 of 140,000. So 10% 10 of 140 give us 14,000. Then times 9 divided by 12, that give us 10,500. The other one would be 3 over 12 of the 14,000 give us 3, 5. 3,500. We continue. Another item we have is the cost of part partitioning office block. Partition, we said it's supposed to be wear and tear. So here we don't look at the office, we look at the partition. Wear and tear, 10%. So wear and tear on partition of office block. So 9 over 12. 3 over 12, 10% of 250. So we take 10% of 250, that would be 25,000 times 9 divided by 12, give you 18,750. The other one would be 25,000 times 3 divided by 12, 62.50. There. And there is no other, there is no other fixed asset in point 5. So we go to point number 6, general expense. For the general expense we had seen is in the PNL, we even deducted it here. And we were told it comprises of the patent rights. The registering of patent rights is not allowable, we had deducted. Flotation cost. Now, flotation cost, we said, is usually for the shares of the limited company. Uh, that one is specifically for the limited company and is allowable on the company. So, we deducted from here because it's specifically for the company. Now, we deduct it on the side of the company. So, flotation costs of shares, which we have the flotation cost of shares to be 48,000. And only on the side of the company. Land uh, a piece of land for business expansion? No, that is not allowable completely. Point number seven: interest on loan included interest on partners capital. Interest on partners capital is not allowable, and we deducted it when we were getting the the interest expense. And that is the end of it for now. We can get now. 
the net taxable operating incomes so what we do we start from here the gross profit plus other income minus the now the allowable expenses we start with the first one 3817 uh, 500 and then we add 360,000 and then we minus 33,750 and then we minus 93,750 then we minus 16,800 and then we minus 183,450 we minus 49,650 And then we minus 597,000. And then we minus 630,000. And then we minus 117,000. And then we minus 111,150. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and then we minus... Uh, 72,000 and then we minus 7,200 and then we minus uh, 4,500 and then we minus 10,5 and then we minus 18,750 give us 22 uh that two thousand that's two million and that two thousand two hundred and that two thousand then we go to the company twelve seventy two five hundred and then we may uh we add uh one twenty thousand and then we minus eleven to fifty and then we minus that one to fifty Then we minus 5600, we minus 61,150, and then we minus 16,550, and then we minus um, 199,000, and then we minus 210,000, and then we minus 39,000. We minus six hundred thousand and then we minus that seven zero fifty and then we minus uh that three sixty thousand we minus twenty four thousand and then we minus twenty four hundred And then we minus 1,500, we minus 3,500, and then we minus 250, we minus 48,000. That gives us a loss of 264,000. Uh, now, um, this is what we said for the partnership. Once you get the net taxable operating income here, it normally ends here. Unless you are told to, pre to distribute to the partner and maybe determine the tax for each partner. But you don't go beyond there. But for a company, it does not usually end here. We normally add taxable investment income. We normally add taxable investment income. If... If a minute, if the operating income is positive, that's the time we add the taxable investment income so that we can determine we can tax them together.
But how about in case the operating income is negative? We don't add, uh, take that loss and deduct it against income from other sources. That's what we said. So for this one, we normally cross here. It will wait until next year where it can be deducted against the taxable profit of next year. But for now, it ends there. So we should not say we add then here because we have a loss from operation. We just now determine the taxable investment income separately and tax the company on that investment income only. For this question, we only had one investment income. In our income statement, the last income is dividend from Cali Cooperative Society. Where we say it, if a, a, a company or a, a person gets dividend from a cooperative society, the withholding tax is not final. We say it's an unqualifying dividend that we should tax it further. So we come and now post it here. We have dividends from Cali Society Cooperative Society. Where we want only for the company, so we only want 3 over 12 or 51. And take note, the 51,000 is not net. Because if it was net, we could have grossed it up to get the gross. Yeah? Because net means that they had already deducted 15%. And we say that we don't tax the net. But this one is not, it's silent, so it's always assumed to be gross. So we take 3 over 12 or 51,000. Give us 12,750. And since there is no other investment income, then that becomes the only taxable income for the company. So, if you look at the required number one, it means we have answered the question. Statement of adjusted taxable profit or loss for the business for the year ending that first December 2014. Done. Hint, start with gross profit. That's what we did. B, comment on the tax position of James, Katana, and the company. Now, this is where you are told. If you are told to comment about the tax position of James and Katana, that is in the partnership. We say, once you get the taxable income of the partnership, you distribute and now tax it on the partners themselves. Since they have asked us about the tax position, we have now to distribute and even determine the tax they are supposed to pay individually. So what do you do? distribute first so we have to prepare the income distribution schedule so we have the gems uh, maybe we need an extra one here so that we have the gems Katana and the totals. We said we want to distribute the operating income, so we start by distributing the taxable operating income of twenty two thirty two thousand. That is what we want to distribute. Positive, remember? So, how do you distribute? We said in the income distribution schedule, we normally look for five items. The salary, the commission to the partner, interest on capital, drawings, and we raise the interest on drawings. So we need to start from the top all the way down. We look for any one of those five items. Among the incomes, you'd expect to get like interest on drawings. That is the one that we are supposed to raise. But in this case, we don't have that in there among the incomes. You go to the expenses, purchases, purchase of computer, partner salary. Yes, we have the partner salary. But then, how are they sharing the salary? Now, there is nowhere, if you go to the additional information, there is nowhere we are told about how they were sharing the salary. This is what we said. If you are not told how they are sharing the five items, and actually you just look at the three actually, the salary, the commission, and interest on capital. If you are not told how they are sharing, share equally. Not according to the profit sharing ratio, share equally. That's the rule. 
So in this case, since we are not told about the partner salary, we share equally. So we'll come here and say partner salary. So the amount is 720 and then we share equally half, half of 720. That is going to give us 720 divided by 2, that is 360. 360, 720. We continue down. After this partner salary, legal fee, rent, repair, interest on loan, general expense, insurance, preliminary, director's fee, audit fee, debenture interest, traveling. There is none that goes to the partners among the one we are looking for. Additional information number one, there is nothing. Number two is about VAT in the sales and purchases. Number three, there is nothing of what you are looking for. Number four, there is nothing of what you are looking for. Five, the same. Six, the same. But number seven, interest on loan include interest on partner's capital of 100, which is shared according to the profit sharing ratio. There we have it. Interest on capital. Where we are told we share according to the profit sharing ratio. The profit sharing ratio was in the first paragraph up there. James and Katana established partnership business sharing profit and losses in the ratio of 3, 2. So the first one will get 3 over 5, 2 over 5 for the second one, over 100. So 3 over 5 times 100. That gives us 60. And this means this one got 40, total 100,000. That was it. And there's nothing else after that. So what remains is for us to share the profit share. That's the last one under here. Profit share, which is now this one, this one, the, we take according to the profit sharing ratio, 3 over 5, 2 over 5 of the 22 32,000 minus what you have distributed interest and salary minus 100,000 minus 720,000 so we will have 22 32,000 and then minus 100,000 and then minus 720 that give us 14 12,000 And then uh, the first one get 3 over 5. Give us 847,200. The other one get 2 over 5 times the 14 12, 000, 564, And now we can get total taxable operating incomes. So we add the operating from the top, the 360, and also 60, and also 847, 200. This got 1267, uh, 200. The other one is 360 and 40 and 564, 800. 964, 800. Then we add the other one, 720,000 plus 100. Plus 14 12,000. That is 22, that 2, and is starting with what we are distributing here. So after that, we said we normally add the taxable investment income. So here we only had one investment income, that is the dividend from the cooperative society.
we had the dividend from the cooperative society and uh, which we said that that is an unqualifying dividend with the holding tax is not final should be taxed further so we come here and say dividend from the uh, Kali Cooperative Society or Kali Cooperative Society. So we take, remember that dividend is for the whole year. And that's why we took the 3 over 12 for the company. So the other remaining 9 over 12 is the one that belongs to the partnership. And now we share according to the profit sharing ratio. So the first one get 2 over 5. The other one, 3 over 5, of uh, the first one is the one that is supposed to get 3, 3 over 5, this other one, 2, of 9 over 12, of uh, 51,000. So, we'll have first 9 over 12 of 51. So that give us 38,250. 38,250. Then we share 3 over 12. Uh, that is 3 over 5 times 38,250. That give us 22,950 for this one. The other one, 2 over 5 times that, 15,300. And since there is no other investment income, we now can get the total taxable incomes. So that means that we take the operating plus investment. So total of 67,200. And then we add 22,950. That gives us total of 91.50. The other one is 964.800. And then we add 15.300. That gives us 980.100. And then we can also get the total 22.32,000. And then we add that each to 50. That give us 2270 to 50. Yeah. However, we have not really answered the question because the question required number two was that we comment on the tax position of James Katana and the company. So we have to get the tax payable. That's the point. So now we go beyond just the, the distribution. So we have to determine, we say, we normally tax these partners individually now. For example, we say, Tax payable by uh, James. Now, we said we normally tax partners using the graduated scale rates. And this graduated scale rates is usually provided in the tax table to compute the tax payable by James, an individual. We are supposed to use the tax table provided in the question paper uh, to compute the tax payable. This is usually provided in an exam, the first page of your question paper. So I'll use the tax table of the year 2021. For the year 2021, there's a table that normally show, assume that the following rates of tax applied throughout the year of 2021, and we have the monthly taxable pay, annual taxable pay, and the rates of tax in each shilling. So because we are looking for the tax for the whole year, not one month, we are going to use the annual taxable pay. In the annual taxable pay, it says between one shilling to 288,000, you tax at the rate of 10%. And then between 288,001 to 388,000, the rate is 25%. And then excess over 388,000, you tax at the rate of 30%. Now, for the James, we can see the income is above 388,000. So we'll go up to the rate of 30%. So we start taxing. Uh, at the rate of 10%, you normally take the last figure appearing at the rate of 10%. You see, it is 1 shilling to 288. So the last figure is 288. So we take 288,000 times 10%. That gives us 28,800. Then we add 
uh, you can see between 288,001 to 388,025%. So for this one, you normally get the difference between the last figure in the rate of 25%, which is 388,000, and you minus the last figure in the previous rate of 10%, 288. The difference is 100,000. So you add 100,000 times 25%. That gives you 25,000. And then you add, you see, Excess over 388,000, 30%. What does it mean by excess of 388,000? It means we have already taxed the 388. The 288,000 plus 100, that is 388. So whatever is above 388, you take 30%. So we are going to say the above is which one? It is going to be the taxable amount, 1290, uh, 150, minus 388,000. And then you multiply by 30%. So, and then uh, we need to compute that, which is going to be the 12 of 90, uh, 150, and then we minus 388,000. That give you 902,150. So we tax at the rate of 30. That give you 270. So this is going to be 270, uh, 645. 645. Now, this one, if you look at that tax table down there, there is a personal relief of 2400 per month, and which is equivalent to 28800 per annum. If you are taxing for the whole year, you take per annum, regardless of how many months the person earned the income. Like this one was nine, but we take the whole year. So the personal relief reduces the tax a person is supposed to pay. So 28800 personal relief. So now we need to add the tax and we minus the personal relief. So it's going to be 28,800 uh, plus 25,000 and then plus 12, uh, that is 7, this is 7, uh, 270, 645. Uh, that is going to be 324,445. And then we minus the personal relief, 28,800. That gives us uh, 295,645. That is the tax payable by James. And then we have the tax payable by Katana. Now, for the Katana income, we find that it is 980,100. If you go to the tax table, we find that we are going to go all the way to the rate of 30% because it is in excess of 388,000. So we start off just like this one. So the first 88,000, we take 10%. We add the next 100,000 times 25%. And then the excess, which is going to be 980. Uh, 100 minus what you have taxed already, the 388. The 288 plus 100, the 388. Where we are told excess over 388, we take 30%. Then we minus the personal relief, 28,800 as, provide, as provided. So 28,800. So we do the computation, 288,000 times 10%, that is 28. 800 this is going to be 25,000 and now this one 98100 and then we minus 388 give us 592100 and then we multiply by 30% give us 177630 now, we add those taxes. So that one plus uh, 177,630 plus 28,800 plus the 25,000. That gives us 231,430 minus the personal relief, 28,800. That gives us 202,630. Uh, that is now the tax payable by Katana. But the question was not about James and Katana only in the required um, 
in the required number two, it was the tax position of James, Katana, and the company. Now, for the company, we said we normally tax at the rate of 30%. So, we are going to take 30% of the taxable income, which is 12750 However, we said if you have an uh, if the investment income is subject to withholding tax at the source, you must minus the withholding tax. So, withholding tax for this dividend, which is non qualifying, is 15%. So, we take 15% of the 12,750. So, we'll take 30% times 12,750, that is 38,25, this 38,25, and then 15% of 12,750, um, which is going to be uh, 63.75 let me do it again 15% times 12.750 that is 19.12.5 so this is going to be 38.25 and then we minus 19.12.5, give you 19.12.5, and that becomes the tax payable by the company. Now that answers Roman 2, uh, that is uh, required number B, about commenting on the tax position of James, Katana, and the company. There is C now, that citing examples advise James and Katana on two areas of tax avoidance that could be uh, could explore for the business. Now, although this is a topic to be done later, there is a topic called tax planning. This way, you are supposed to look at all these. But to fully uh, answer the question, I just mentioned them. And then, when you do the tax planning, you learn more about it. Now, tax avoidance; those are measures that they they can put in place to legally reduce the tax they are supposed to pay. Now, what are those measures? Now, one of them, we saw in additional information number six, that there was a flotation cost, flotation cost. Flotation cost is usually the cost of issuing shares. So they issued the shares to the public. So instead of issuing shares, the best option they, they could have taken, usually the company, is to take a loan or issue more debentures. So, one, we have a issue debentures or take a loan. Instead of uh, issuing shares. Because costs of loan and debentures, the cost of loans and debentures is called interest, is allowable expense. While cost of shares, that is uh, dividends are non allowable expenses. You learn more about this in tax planning. Two, we saw in additional information number four, there is signing of a 100 year lease agreement. And we said the cost of signing a 100 year lease agreement when you are looking at the legal cost. Uh, 128,400, we treated that as non-arrowable. 
because we say that lease up to 99 years is the one that is allowable. Above 99, we don't allow. So the best option they could have taken is to sign a lease of 99 years instead of 100 years so that the legal costs of signing come become the legal cost of signing become allowable expense so that is what we had said and now the last one uh, we had seen that they had joined a cooperative society whose withholding the, the dividend they get the withholding tax is not final instead they should join a circle where we say that circle dividend is a, a, a qualifying dividend with the holding tax is final so join a circle that is saving and credit cooperative society or circles instead of cooperative society that was the Kali cooperative society uh, where withholding tax on dividend is final tax yeah so those are the opportunities available for tax avoidance so that one bring us to the end of this lesson about the conversion of a partnership into a limited company during the year where we have looked at how you can use the net profit method and the gross profit method to get the taxable income and how to go ahead and tax the businesses the partnership the partners and also that of the limited company so that mark actually the end of the taxation of the partnership now when we meet in the next lesson we'll be looking at the taxation of the next business after partnership the limited company for today we are going to reach there until next lesson thank you very much see you in the next lesson hello candidates uh, today i'll be standing in for mr j m kimani for the introductory lesson in absorption and marginal costing. This is a very critical uh, topic in the CPS syllabus, more so the management and accounting. Now, uh, this topic is uh, to be covered in several subtopics. That is, uh, we will be looking at the distinction between marginal and absorption costing, valuation of products under marginal and absorption costing, preparation of marginal and absorption statements, costing of product and profit determination, applications of marginal costing, and uh, marginal costing at this level we'll be looking at the break-even analysis and charts of a single product. Next we have the simplified decision problems, problems like uh, accept or reject, special order, dropping a product, make or buy. We will be looking at, uh, we will be solving problems under uh, these subsections, accept or reject. Uh, special order, dropping a product, make or buy. Then lastly, the subtopic there is operating statements. So these are the uh, areas that we tend to cover under the topic marginal and absorption costing. Candidates, in our today's lesson, we are going to define marginal costing We'll also define absorption costing. We will look at the differences between marginal costing and absorption costing. Then we will, I'll show you the format that can be used when preparing 
the income statement under marginal costing and absorption costing. So the topic, once again, is marginal and absorption costing. These are two things, marginal and absorption costing. First, we will define uh, absorption costing, then we'll define marginal costing. We'll see the differences between the two as we progress. So let's first define absorption, absorption, absorption costing. Candidates allow me to have two columns. Allow me to have two columns here. Where I'll define absorption costing. Then I'll define marginal costing marginal costing. Now, candidates, absorption costing is, absorption costing is a technique, a technique, or we can call it a principle. We can call it a method. All right, it is a technique um, where, where um, variable and fixed costs, fixed costs and variable costs, costs are charged to product costs, are charged to product costs. It is a technique in prepara preparation of the, uh, the, the income statement. It is a technique used in preparing an income statement. And, and absorption costing, fixed costs and variable costs are charged to the product cost, are charged to the product cost are uh, absorbed okay both fixed costs and 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 variable costs are charged to the product cost in other words when determining the cost of a product then uh, the fixed cost and the variable cost of producing that product are taken into account. In other words, the fixed costs and the product costs are included in the cost of a product. That's why it's also sometimes referred to as the product cost. The product cost. This is also referred to as a product cost or this technique can be referred to as product costing. Product costing, product costing. In other words, I've said all costs, all costs are identified, are identified to production, are identified to production. And I've said that uh, this method of costing, this method of costing is also known as, also known as product costing. In other books, you'll see names like full costing full costing or conventional, 
conventional, conventional, conventional, conventional costing. Conventional costing. So that is absorption costing. How about marginal costing? Now, under marginal costing, the marginal costing is also a technique. It's a method that is used in um, costing. Um, under marginal costing, only variable, only variable costs, costs are charged, are charged to, to, units to cost units so that means fixed costs are, are, are let me say fixed cost of the period fixed cost of the period are written off are written of in full against 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 contribution against contribution shortly i'll be defining contribution i'll be defining contribution uh, fixed costs of the period are written off in in full all right against against let me put it clearly against contribution that means fixed costs are deducted from contribution where contribution is equal to contribution is equal to sales minus variable costs contribution is equal to sales minus variable cost. So after deducting variable cost from sales, when you deduct variable cost from sales, what you remain is what we are calling the contribution. It is from this contribution that we deduct the fixed costs of the period. This is unlike the absorption costing where there is no distinction. No distinction is made between the costs. All costs are absorbed. All costs are absorbed when determining uh, the cost of a product. The cost of a product. So marginal costing, um, marginal costing, uh, let me say is also known known as is also known as direct costing is also known as direct costing or variable costing variable costing or direct 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 costing direct costing so these are the main differences uh, learners let me take an example of this pen now this pen this one here there are certain costs that are attributed to this pen and uh, according to this method the absorption method when using this technique when using this technique all costs both fixed costs and variable costs are absorbed or they are identified to this pen okay this pen may have uh, for you to produce this pen you may need di direct material you may need direct labor you may need direct expenses you may need to incur uh, fixed production overheads. You may incur variable production 
overheads and so on okay so when 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 determining the price uh, or the, the the cost of this pen then you take into consideration all these costs but when costing uh, using the marginal costing okay when determining the value of products using uh, the marginal costing method or technique then these fixed costs are not considered you only consider the direct labor direct material direct expenses and variable costs and variable costs so that is uh, the definition of absorption costing and marginal costing candidates i now want us to uh, continue understanding more about these techniques by studying the differences or the distinctions the differences differences between absorption and marginal costing we can learn more about these two by studying their differences and these differences can be based on certain factors like the 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 segregation of course the distinctions can be made based on let me write here uh, let me write here basis basis of distinction number one can be the segregation segregation of costs segregation of of costs segregation of costs segregation of costs that can be one basis another basis um, i'll put more another basis here but i want us to distinguish absorption costing from marginal costing marginal costing on the basis of segregation of costs segregation of costs now under absorption costing just as we have defined here uh, costs costs are, are never are never classified classified into fixed and variable we don't classify all the costs all the costs are allotted all the costs are absorbed but under marginal marginal costing marginal costing uh, costs must be classified costs must be classified into cost must be classified into fixed and variable cost must be classified into fixed and variable that is one distinguishing uh, feature number 2 Number two, distinction between absorption and marginal costing can be made on the basis of number two, number two, fixed production overheads. Fixed production overheads. Under absorption costing, fixed production overheads are included are included 
in uh, cost per unit. Because remember here there is still no distinction. But under marginal costing, fixed production overheads are not included in the cost per unit. If you are to produce this pen and you are costing, under marginal costing, the fixed production overhead. This is the factory cost. It's not included in the cost of that pen. That is number two. The second distinguishing feature. Then number three, you can distinguish absorption and marginal costing on the basis of valuation of inventories or stocks. Inventories or stocks. Under absorption, absorption costing, stocks, stocks are valued, stocks are valued at total cost, that is fixed plus variable cost. Valuation of stock is based on the total cost. Under the uh, marginal costing, under the marginal costing, stocks are valued, are valued uh, only at variable, only at variable cost. Stocks are valued only at variable cost. That is number three. Number three. Then we move on to number four. Number four. Another method will be ascertainment. Ascertainment of profit. Ascertainment of profit. Under absorption uh, costing, profit is equal to sales minus cost of goods sold. That is the total cost. The total cost. Total cost of goods sold. But under marginal costing, under marginal costing, ascertainment of profit is not the same, it's different. Under marginal costing, under marginal costing, ascertainment, ascertainment is done by computing contribution as I had showed earlier and and then deducting deducting the total fixed the total fixed expenses you first calculate the contribution, which is equal to sales minus variable cost. Then after you get the contribution, you deduct fixed cost from contribution to arrive at the profit. Ascertainment of profit is done by calculating the contribution first, then deducting the total fixed cost from the contribution. So that is uh, one way in which you can distinguish these two by looking at the difference, uh, the features. We've seen the differences here based on segregation of course, fixed uh, production overheads, valuation of stocks, and ascertainment of profit. Now, candidates, I want us to, to, I want to show you the format of uh, both 
the format of both the absorption costing and marginal costing and still uh, be just based on what we are learning we want to uh, come up with a format for how to prepare income statement using absorption costing technique or method. So first we have the cells as usual. Then from these cells we deduct the cost of goods produced the cost of goods produced which will be equal to less manufacturing cost of goods sold how do we get that we take the direct labor direct direct labor we add direct let me begin with direct material direct material direct material we add direct labor we add direct expenses we add we'll add variable variable um, variable variable production uh, variable production overheads I add this is absorption I'll add the fixed production overheads so additions here so what we have here will be the cost of goods manufactured cost of goods cost of goods produced or manufactured cost of goods produced so we take the direct material, direct labor, direct expenses, variable production overhead, variable production, uh, uh, fixed production overhead, under absorption costing, we don't segregate, all right? All the costs are allotted or identified or absorbed or identified. Then after that, we will come and add, add, add opening stock then less closing stock closing stock we add we deduct less okay after that we'll have the cost of goods sold we'll have here the cost of goods sold the cost of goods sold then we we make an adjustment we are going to add 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 under absorbed under absorbed under absorbed fixed production overheads then less less over absorbed over absorbed fixed production overheads we add we subtract then what do we get here after that we are going to get the adjusted adjusted 
adjusted cost of goods sold that will be the adjusted 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 uh, adjusted manufacturing cost of goods of goods cost of goods sold cost of goods sold this we are going to deduct from sales deduct from these sales to get the gross profit this is the gross profit then from that growth profit we deduct the other expenses the other overheads less 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 variable less variable admin overheads less fixed admin overheads less variable selling and distribution overheads less fixed fixed uh, fixed selling and distribution overheads okay this is selling there could be other costs like variable research and development overheads fixed research and development overheads all these we are going to deduct this total we are going to deduct from the gross profit and the final amount here will be the profit net profit the net profit under absorption costing under absorption costing that is the net profit so you have realized or noticed candidates that we have deducted virtually all the costs both variable and fixed now coming to the preparation of the income statement using a, using marginal costing this is how to prepare how to prepare income income statement under marginal costing under marginal costing shillings shillings so we start with the sales sales okay then we are going to deduct the cost of sales cost of sales but first we need to calculate the contribution which we say is equal to sales minus variable cost so first we will deduct the direct materials direct materials followed by direct labor direct labor followed by direct expenses direct expenses these three uh, will is what we call the prime cost that is the prime cost then uh, we come to we add variable production overheads add variable production overheads what we'll have here is the variable 
variable cost of goods produced variable cost of goods produced variable cost of goods produced then we go ahead and add add opening stock we add opening stock we deduct closing stock closing stock what we have here will be the variable cost of goods sold not the difference candidates this is the cost of goods produced because these are costs that are incurred or produced in the factory that's why we have here production overheads these are factory overheads so that gives us the variable cost of goods produced when you add and deduct op uh, opening and closing stock respectively what we'll have here is the cost of goods sold the cost of goods sold then what else what else then we come and um, add add variable variable admin overheads then we add variable remember it's just variable variable selling and distribution overheads we add we add we add then the total here we come here and subtract from the sales remember now this is the variable cost of sales the variable cost of sales is deducted from sales then what we get here is what we call contribution contribute contribution what we have here now is the contribution now it is from this contribution that we are going to deduct the other fixed expenses all these are variable expenses that we have deducted from sales to give us a contribution we now go ahead and deduct the fixed overheads less less fixed 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 overheads fixed overheads and what are these overheads these are fixed number one fixed fixed production production overheads these are overheads that are incurred in the factory remember here we did not deduct but under under the absorption costing you see where the deduction is made because we are not segregating we are uh, accumulating the costs as they are incurred but under the marginal costing the fixed overheads will be deducted way after we have determined the contribution so that is a fixed production overheads then we have fixed admin overheads then i have the fixed selling and distribution overheads okay so all these overheads are to be deducted from the contribution to get what i'm calling here net profit under marginal costing net profit under marginal marginal costing technique net profit under the marginal costing technique that is the format thank you candidates for appearing in this initial class of the marginal and costing we have defined uh, absorption that is marginal costing and absorption costing we have defined the marginal costing and absorption costing we've given the distinction between the two and i've shown you the format in the next lesson uh, 
Mr. J.M. Kimani will continue with the lessons. He's going to uh, do a comprehensive uh, question, comprehensive question. And it's through that question, he will also demonstrate to you uh, the under absorbed fixed co uh, production costs and the and the over absorbed fixed uh, production costs why is it that under the absorption costing we have over absorption of fixed costs and and they, we may have over absorption of fixed costs or, or under ab absorption of fixed costs yet in the marginal costing we do not have such uh, absorption under absorption or over absorption. Under marginal costing, over and under absorption uh, costing does not arise. And uh, that will be explained in our subsequent lesson. Our today's lesson was an introductory lesson to help you appreciate the definitions and the salient features and, and, and characteristics and distinctions, then the format. Thank you and Bye bye. Greetings, candidates. Welcome to the study of advanced public financial management. The topic the Office of the Auditor General. Candidates, you are expected to explain the role of parliament as an oversight body under the topic the office of auditor general by the end of this lesson you should be able to explain the role of parliament as an oversight body and candidates we all know that uh, parliament is a legislative elected body of government and it has a number of um, functions uh, like uh, representing the electorate, making laws, uh, authorizing government to spend public money, scrutinizing activities of government ministries, departments, as well as agencies. Parliament is also a forum for debate on national issues <clears throat> and so on. So, the parliament, furthermore candidates, the parliament of Kenya is a bicameral parliament that consists of two houses. That is the National Assembly and the Senate. It is composed of the Speaker of the National Assembly, the Speaker of the Senate, their deputies, and members of parliament that are commonly referred to as members of the National Assembly and senators. So the question is, what are the role, what is the role of parliament as an oversight body? As an oversight body. Oversight body. Oversight. What is the meaning of oversight? Now candidates, Oversight is the process by which the parliament monitors the quality of the work of government regarding implementation of laws, uh, development, uh, development of um, plans, development of uh, or preparation of budgets that have been previously adopted by the parliament. So candidates, parliamentary oversight is defined as review or monitoring of government and public institutions, including implementation of policies, implementation of laws, and so on. So, parliament oversight, uh, I can also say, provides democratic legitimacy by representing the views of the public while at the same time ensuring that 
political authorities and uh, security institutions are restricted to their lawful roles. Parliamentary oversight also prevents abuse of power, prevents abuse of human rights, and violations by the state authorities. Violations by the state authorities. That is the meaning of parliamentary oversight. So candidates, the key functions, key functions of parliamentary oversight include the key functions of parliamentary oversight include number one to detect and prevent illegal and unconstitutional conduct detect and prevent illegal and unconstitutional conduct to detect and prevent unconstitutional conduct on the part of the government and public agencies. That is the one key function of parliamentary oversight. And at the core of this function, candidates, is the protection of the rights and liberties of the citizens. The second function is to hold the government to account. Hold the government to account. To hold the government um, to account in respect of how the taxpayer's money is used. And this is, to, this is done by detecting waste within the, uh, the machinery of government and also public agencies. And candidates, therefore, we can say by Detecting wastages within the government and the government agencies, they, that leads to improvement uh, of efficiency, improvement of effectiveness, improvement in, um, in uh, the economy, um, and also efficiency of government operations. That is a key function of parliamentary oversight. The other one is relation to policies. Policies to ensure that to ensure that policies announced by the government and authorized by the parliament are actually delivered. Delivery of policies. The policies that are announced by the government and the policies that are authorized by, by parliament it is a key function of parliamentary oversight to ensure that such policies are delivered, they are actually delivered. And this, functions, uh, this function includes uh, uh, monitoring the achievement of goals uh, that are set by legislation and that are set by the government uh, programs and so on. Another key function is to improve transparency improve transparency to improve transparency to improve transparency and this is transparency of government operations and also to enhance public trust in the government which is itself a condition of effective policy delivery so candidates Parliaments can use the powers, can use its powers to verify whether the laws and policies um, 
on, for example, on security are being implemented and the implementation, implementation must be effective. The, 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 the parliament can also use its powers to, um, to ensure that the policies have been implemented effectively. So these are some of the key functions of parliamentary oversight. And the typical powers, candidates, for democratic oversight um, may include, because it's important, candidates, for us to note down uh, the powers that the parliament should have in order to carry out these functions. So we are now going to discuss the powers for democratic oversight by parliament. Powers for democratic oversight. Powers for democratic oversight by parliament. What power does parliament have in order to carry out these key functions? We have said detecting uh, and prevent, preventing illegal and unconstitutional conduct by government and government agencies, holding the government to account, delivery of policies, improving efficiency, and so on. Now, candidates, the first power that um, a parliament has is the right to question the executive, the right to question the executive, the right to question the executive arm of government. Okay? The right to question the executive in parliamentary sessions and also to debate the merits of government policies and, and, and decisions. Right to debate. To debate executive policies and programs. Number three, the right to demand, the right to demand um, security officials and executive, security officials and executive authorities account for their decisions, account for their decisions, their right to demand security officials and executive authorities account for their decisions, account for their conduct, account for their decisions, account for their conduct or use of resources or use of resources or use of resources and sometimes that has to be done under oath and that may also include candidates the right to assess sensitive or classified information right to access sensitive or classified classified sites classified uh, information including briefings by security institutions the parliament also has 
the right to gather evidence the right to gather evidence including visiting and inspecting security installations gathering testimonies and assessing government documents and sometimes including operational information another right is right the right to 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 conduct official inquiries right to conduct official inquiries the right to conduct official inquiries uh, that also may include investigations or independent audits in cases where misconduct or abuse of office is um, it, or is suspected they also have right to make recommendations right to um, to make let me say findings and recommendations the right to make findings and recommendations and that has to be done without endangering um, sensitive information so these are the powers for democratic oversight by parliament we started by listing the functions of parliamentary oversight the first function is to detect and prevent illegal or unconstitutional um, conduct holding the government to account delivery ensuring that the govern government delivers on the, po uh, the policies um, that are uh, that they have promised uh, and also improving transparency and so on for the parliament to carry out these functions i've said then parliament needs to have certain powers these are the powers for democratic oversight by parliament the first power is a right to question the executive uh, that's number one number two is the right to debate executive policies and programs the right to demand uh, that security officials and executive uh, uh, executive authorities account for decisions account for conduct to account for use of resources and uh, that has to be sometimes done under oath we also say that uh, the parliament has a right to access sensitive or classified information the right to also collect uh, evidence including visiting uh, security institutions the right to um, uh, to, to demand or initi initiate um, official inquiries the right to make findings and also recommendations so candidates these are the powers of democratic oversight and that effectively brings this today's lesson to a close we are studying the role of parliament as an oversight body we set out the objective of this lesson we have said that by the end of this lesson you should be able to outline the functions of parliament uh, oversight and we've gone ahead to list the powers of parliament in order to carry out the parliament has that will enable it to carry out the parliamentary oversight thank you for attending our today's lesson in our next session we we'll continue to study the role of parliament and in the next lesson we will consider parliamentary committees parliamentary committees because candidates uh, you are expected to understand the role of parliament as an oversight body and also parliamentary oversight committees in both the national assembly and the senate thank you god bless you bye bye <laughs>
Greetings candidates and welcome back to the lesson. The subject is auditing and assurance. Today we are proceeding from where we stopped. In our last lesson we studied about agreed upon procedures where we defined agreed upon procedures and gave we then gave examples, seven examples of agreed upon procedures. Today we want to study compilation engagements. In our today's lesson we'll define compilation engagements, then we will uh, understand some key points about compilation engagements. Compilation engagements. First of all, we define compilation engagements. The word compilation is derived from the word compile. To compile. Alright? To compile. Compilation engagement will then refer to a type of a service that is provided by accountants in which they assist in preparing financial statements based on information provided by a client. Compiling, compiling, all right? In a compilation engagement, the accountant's role is limited to presenting the financial information in the form of financial statements without providing any assurance or expressing an opinion on the accuracy or, or compliance with accounting standards. So here, again, just like the agreed upon procedures, the accountant does not give an opinion on the financial statements. The accountant only helps the company to compile the financial statements. So we are going to study a few points in, related, in relation to compilation engagements. The first one is the purpose. What is the purpose? The purpose of compilation engagement. Now the purpose of a compilation engagement is to assist the client in presenting financial information in the form of financial statements. So a client may have financial information like the ledgers, like the source documents, like the um, business papers, those or just records, financial records, but the expert, the professional can come in to assist the client in converting the financial information into financial statements. And financial statements would be uh, statements like the, the uh, statement of financial position or, or, or statement of income. Right, statement of income. So converting the financial information into financial statement. That is, could be the purpose of compilation engagement. The client company engages a, a, an accountant to help in compilation of the uh, financial statements. So where a, an accountant is hired to help a client to present financial information in form of financial statements, then we say such an arrangement is known as a compilation engagement. And the accountant's role is primarily administrative. It, it is what? It is primarily administrative, involving the organization, the classification, and the presentation of the Clients' financial data. Purpose. That's the purpose of compilation engagement. This engagement also has what we call limited, limited assurance. Limited assurance. Unlike an audit or a review engagement, a compilation engagement does not provide any assurance on the accuracy or completeness of financial statements. The accountant does not perform substantial or substantive procedures or obtain evidence to support the amounts and disclosures in the financial statements. It's a limited assurance. Does not provide any assurance. Just compiles. The accountant simply compiles without providing 
any assurance or performing substantive procedures or obtaining evidence to support the amounts contained in the financial statements. Then one important point to discuss here is the client's responsibilities. Clients, what are the client's responsibilities? What are the client's responsibilities in a compilation engagement? Now, in a compilation engagement, the client is responsible for providing the accountant with complete and accurate financial information. Because we say that the accountant converts financial information into financial statements. So the responsibility of the client is to provide accurate and complete financial information or financial records so that such records can be used by the accountant to compile financial statements. So the accountant may request additional explanations or clarifications, but the responsibility of the accuracy and completeness of the data rests with the client organization. Do you understand? Of course you do. Number four, what are the accountant's responsibilities you have seen the responsibility of the client but what are the responsibilities of the accountant now the accountant's primary responsibility in a compilation uh, uh, engagement is to organize the financial information provided by the client into the appropriate financial statements format and they may make adjustments for obvious errors or inconsistencies but they do not verify the accuracy or reasonableness of the client's data. That's the responsibility of the accountant, is to convert the financial information into, uh, transform it into financial statements. Because candidates, the, the, the purpose of preparing financial records is so that the records can be used by different stakeholders to make informed decision and the records cannot be well be used by the stakeholders unless they are presented in form of statements and there are companies that may not have the expertise to prepare financial statements so that's why the accountant who is not a professional may be hired the company may enter into an agreement with the, an accountant, an agreement we are calling compilation engagement, so that the uh, accountant can help the organization to prepare financial statements, which can then be used uh, to make informed decisions. So that's the accountant's responsibility. Engagement letter. Engagement. Another important uh, point to discuss here is engagement engagement letter. Now, before undertaking a compilation engagement, the accountant and the client typically enter into an agreement that outlines the scope of the engagement, the responsibilities of both parties, and any limitations on the accountant's services. So what is the report's format? What is the format of the, the compila compilation engagement uh, report? What's the format? Now in a compilation engagement, the accountant may issue what we call a compilation report that accompanies the financial statements. So that report indicates that the financial statements have been compiled but do not provide any assurance on their accuracy. It clearly says that no audit or review procedures have been performed. That is important to indicate in 
a compilation report. So remember the work here for the accountant is to help the organization prepare financial statements from financial information. So having prepared the financial statements, then such financial statements have to be accompanied by a compilation report. And it said that in a compilation report, the report indicates that the financial statements have been compiled but do not provide any assurance on their accuracy. The report must clearly state that no audit or review, engage, or review procedures were performed during compilation engagement. Then lastly, having now the report, what will be now the use? Use of compiled, and not just compiled compilation report, but the financial statements. Compiled financial statements. Of course, a report is just a report, but uh, it's a, it accompanies the financial. The, the purpose is to come up with the financial statements. So how are these financial statements used? The use of financial statements. Now, compiled financial statements are often used for internal purposes or for providing financial information to third parties such as lenders, shareholders, um, or even potential investors. However, however, it is important to know that compiled financial statements carry less credibility and reliability compared to audited or reviewed financial statements. And it is crucial to understand that compilation engagements differ significantly from audits or review engagements in terms of the level of assurance provided. So clients who are seeking higher levels of assurance should consider engaging in an audit or a review engagement where the accountant performs additional procedures to express an opinion on the financial statements. So that is important to note. There's a big difference between compilation engagement and the assurance engagement. And you can be asked, distinguish between a compilation engagement and an assurance engagement. And having um, attended the previous lessons, you should be able to give at least five distinctions between compilation engagement and the assurance engagement. So then that should be your assignment. Your assignment today is highlight five differences between compilation engagement and an assurance engagement. Bye bye, that will mark the end of the lesson. there. I'm Patrick Amaukamure and I'm the one who is taking you through the advanced taxation where I continue teaching you about the taxation of the businesses and so far we have been able to look at the partnership which we said it consists of two areas the admission and retirement of a partner during the year and also the conversion of a partnership into a limited company. Once we are done with that then we go to the taxation of the limited company. Now we have been able to look at the uh, questions about the admission and retirement of a partner during the year and also the conversion. But in the conversion, uh, we were able to only look at uh, one side of determining the taxable income. That is when you are required to use the net profit method. So how about in case where you are required to use the gross profit method? How do you about, uh, go about it? So I want us to look at a question concerning that. This question comes from uh, November. Twenty fifteen, question number three. And I want us to go through it. This is what the question says.
James and Katana established a partnership business, sharing profits and losses in the ratio of 3 to respectively. The following is the income statement of the partnership for the year ending that 1st December 2014. We have the sales consisting of an DRI's foreign exchange gain, a capital gain on sale of shares, recovery from insurance on stock stolen, goods transferred to a branch at cost, dividend from Cali Cooperative Society, and total incomes. Then rest expenses which you have purchases, purchase of computers, partner salary, legal fee, repair and maintenance, rent and rates, interest on loan, general expenses, motor vehicle expenses, insurance, preliminary expenses, director's fee, audit fees, debenture interest, traveling expenses, and net loss. Additional information number one, the partnership was converted into a limited liability company by the name Kaka Limited on 1st October 2014. Incomes and expenses accrued even through the year, unless otherwise stated. Uh, number two, purchases and sales were inclusive of VAT at the rate of 16%. Closing stock was valued at 18,040,000, while opening stock was at 10,000 of the sales. Net of value added tax. Number four, legal fee complies a uh, petition to association of manufacturers, notice for change of business name, conveyance fee for business premise, stamp duty, negotiating a business loan, recovery of bad debts, signing a 100-year lease agreement, purchase of partners' private residence by James, appeal against tax arrears. Number five, repair and maintenance compliant, purchase of furniture, installation of neon sign, designing of an office block, cost of partitioning office block, repainting of the business premises. Number six, general expenses included registering of patent rights 64,000, flotation costs of 48,000, and negotiating costs for an additional piece of land for business expansion at 56,000. Number seven, interest on loan include interest on partners capital of shillings 100,000, which was shared according to the profit and loss sharing ratio. Required, one, a statement of adjusted taxable profit or loss for the business for the year ending that 1st December 2014. Hint, start with gross profit. B, comment on the tax position of James, Katana and the company. C, uh, citing examples, advise James Katana on two areas of tax avoidance that they could explore for the business. So, we can see in this question, we are required, number one, to get the statement of adjusted taxable profit loss of the business. Now, in this case, you take note that um, there is a conversion. A partnership business that was existing was converted into a limited company as per additional information number one. And from the additional information number one, we can see the partnership business lasted for a period of nine months and then the limited company three months because the conversion happened on 1st October 2014 and the year of income is ending on that 1st of December 2014. So how do we go about getting the taxable income? Remember we say that conversion, we always use the gross profit method unless it is stated otherwise. Now here it is hinted that hint we start with the gross profit. Although they have hinted, they don't have to hint. Even if they haven't hint, hinted, we are supposed to use the gross profit method. When they say you start with gross profit, they mean that gross profit become one of your first income. And that does not mean that you look for gross profit somewhere and then you transfer here. No. What you do, you have to post the sales. The cost of sales, you get the gross profit. And then you continue from there. Uh, another thing that we said about the conversion is we must be able to separate the two business, the period of the partnership and the period of the limited company because these are two different businesses. When we are taxing them, we tax them separately and differently. So here we start. So as we have noted, the partnership lasted for a period of nine months in that year and the limited company three months in that year. So here we are using the gross profit method. So we start with the sales. We we'll start with the sales. So we take nine over 12, three over 12 of the sales figure given is 67, 28, 
thousand. But there's something that we are told about this uh, sales. If you look at additional information number two, we are told that the purchases and sales were inclusive of VAT at the rate of 16% where applicable. So that means this sales has VAT. So this sales is at 116%. Remember when you are getting the taxable income, VAT should not be factored in anywhere. So if they have the VAT, we need to remove the VAT. So we want to get the sales without VAT. So if this is 116%, we must be willing to get the 100. So take note that we are not interested in the VAT, the 16%. No, we want the cost without VAT, the 100. So if this is 116, 100 will be what? Cross multiply, it will mean that you multiply by 100 over 116. So... 67, 28,000 times 100 divided by 116. And then this we get is 5,800,000. And then we take times 9 over 12. That gives us 43,50. And this other one is going to be 5,800,000 times 3 over 12, which we get 14.50. Now, gross profit method after getting the sales, we normally less the cost of sales. For the cost of sales, we normally start with the opening stock, of which case in this question, the opening stock we are told in additional information number 3. Closing stock was valued at 18.40, while opening stock was 10% of sales, net of VAT. So the opening stock is 10% of the sales, net of VAT. The sales that is net of VAT does not have the VAT, it's 5,800,000. 5, so you take times 5, 800. That translates to 580,000. And then we add the purchases the purchases is in the income statement the first expense actually 2842 so plus 2842000 000. but we are told this one as well in additional information number 2 it had the vat so we must exclude the vat we do the same we did with the sales so times 100 over 116 let us get how much that is. So 2842,000 uh, times 100 divided by 116 give us 2450,000. And then we less the closing stock. The closing stock is given in point 3, additional information number 3. Closing stock was valued at 18.40. So minus 18.40,000. And then also remember, we say that we also deduct any item that reduced the stock during the year. Do we have it? Yes. If you go to the incomes, among the incomes in the income statement, there is sales, unrealized foreign exchange gain, capital gain, recovery from insurance on stock stolen. It is telling you that there were stocks that were stolen. So if they were stolen, this must be deducted from here. The stolen stock was 480. Minus 480. You also have the uh, goods transferred to the branch at cost. That, remember, you are just transferring goods from one place of the business to another, from the head office to the branch. There is no impact in addition to that. Because the stocks are still within the company, the branch and the head office are one and the same thing. And there is no other item that affected the cost of goods. So we cross. And then we apportion. Don't forget to apportion. We want the 9 months. So 9 over 12. The other one 3 over 12. So we are going to have the 580 thousand uh, plus 2450 thousand and then minus 1840 thousand and then we minus 480,000. 
that give us 710 and then we multiply by 9 divide by 12 532 500 and then the other one is going to be 710 times 3 over 12 that give us 177 500 mm -hmm. so after that we can now get the gross profit gross profit will be sales minus the cost of sales in which case we have 43 50 thousand minus 532 500 which give us 38 17 38 17 uh, 500 this other one is 14 50 thousand minus 177 500 give us 1272 uh, 500 now that is the gross profit and then we said once you get the gross profit you normally add other taxable So, we need to go through the question, determine if they are taxable operating from operation. Now, the incomes are in the income statement after the sales, where we have unrealized foreign exit gain. Unrealized foreign exit gain, we said we don't usually tax. We only tax realized or if it is silent, just realize uh, foreign exit gain. The other one is capital gain on sale of shares. Shares are investment, so not operating. Recovery from insurance on stock stolen. We say that, that income from uh, compensation from the insurance company for stock stolen, that is supposed to be a taxable income. So, we come here, insurance compensation. We have 9 over 12, 3 over 12, of 480. Mm hmm so we have 9 divided by 12 times 480,000. That gives us 360. The other one is 3 over 12 of the same, 120. Mm -hmm. We continue. After the recovery from insurance on stock stolen in the income statement, there is goods transfer to a branch. That is not a sale. You are just moving your goods from one place of the business to another, from the head office to the branch. Nothing. Dividend from Cali Cooperative. That's an investment income. Here we want only the operating. After that, we have the expenses. Maybe in the additional information, you need to confirm with additional information to confirm whether you have an income. But if you look at all of them from number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, there is no income whatsoever. So meaning, we can now less. So, we need to go through the whole question again. And especially in the income statement where expenses start. Any allowable expense, we deduct here. And the first expense is purchases. Now, purchases, we use to get the cost of sales. So it's already considered there. The other one is purchase of computer. Computer is not... An allowable expense. It's a fixed asset. What we allow for computer is the way and tier. And because here we are looking at allowable expense now, way and tier should be deducted. So where and tier on computers. We take 9 over 12, 3 over 12 of 25% of 130, um, 180.
So 25% of 180, that gives us 45 times 9 divided by 12, give us 33, 750. The other one is 3 divided by 12 times 45,000, that gives us 11 to 50. So we continue. So the next expense in line is the partner's salaries. But we said partner's salary is not allowable. It's for the partnership and it's not allowed. The other one is legal fee. Legal fee we said is usually allowable unless it, is, it has additional information. It is explained further, which is the case in here. If you look at the point number four, it is saying legal fee complied, petition to association of manufacturer and the rest. So what you need to do, you may you need to post one figure here because we are to me we are to using the gross profit method now. You post another allowable expense is the legal fee. So you take nine over twelve, three over twelve off. The legal expense is six eighty. Minus, because you want to remain with the expense that is allowable of the legal, just minus the non-arrowables, the ones that are not supposed to be allowable. In additional information number four, we are told, legal fee complies of petition to association of manufacturers. We had said anything paid to the trade association is allowable. Association of manufacturers, that is supposed to be an allowable expense. Then notice for change of business name. Now we said that for an expense to be allowable, it must be income generating. This one change of business name has nothing to do with the income generation. We don't allow that. So minus 64,800. Then we have the conveyance fee for business premises. We say the conveyance fee is the legal cost to transfer a fixed asset. And we don't usually allow it. So we minus 72,400. Again, stamp duty. Stamp duty is a form of tax. Taxes are usually not allowable. We said that. So we minus uh, 36,600. The other one is negotiating a business loan. We had said legal cost relating to loan. Bonds and debentures are not allowed. So this one is not. So 2,800. The other one is the recovery of bad debts. Recovery of bad debt, we said, is usually allowable. We said, any legal cost relating to debtors and customers allowed. Then signing a 100-year lease agreement. We say that the lease up to 99 years is the one that we allow legal cost. Any above that, we don't. So this is not allowable. 128, 400. After that, we have the purchase of the partner's private residence. We had said that any expense relating to the partners, we don't allow. This for private, for the partners, we don't allow. 150. The other one is appeal against tax arrears. We had said any expense relating to tax, we don't allow. So this one is not. So minus 82. Then we cross. So whatever remains there become the allowable legal costs, which we now we apportion. So it is going to be 680,000, uh, the overall legal cost minus the non allowable 64,800, minus 72,400, minus 36,600, minus 2,800, minus 128,400. And then we minus 150,000. And then we minus 82,000. That gives us 125,000. Then we take times 9 divided by 12. And 3,750. The other one we say 3 divided by 12 of 125,000. That gives us that one to fifty. 
Uh -huh. Then we continue. We go back to the income statement and continue looking for allowable expenses. After that, there is repair and maintenance. Repair and maintenance is allowable expense. However, there is a point number five about it. If there is something mentioning that item, go check. So that you determine if there are some parts which are not allowed, you remove them. Like it includes purchase of furniture. That's a fixed asset. Fixed asset we claim we entire capital allowance for furniture. Installation of neon sign, that's supposed to be we entire. A designing of an office block, that's a fixed asset. That require IBD, office block. Cost of partitioning office block, we entire to ten percent. Repainting of the business premise, that is now the allowable. So we have repair. So we take 9 over 12, 3 over 12, of the overall 568,400. Remove the Nanarawa boss, like furniture 96,000. The other one is neon sign 60. You have the office block 140. You have the partitioning 250. That. So we have 568, uh, 400, minus 96,000, minus 60,000, minus 140,000, and then we minus 250,000. So that gives us 22,400. And you can take note that uh, the only expense that is allowable in number five is repair of business premise. So if you remove all the others which are not allowable, you still remain with that, the 22,400. So you can as well pick that and call it repair and maintenance and then you post it there. So we times by nine, divide by 12, which you have 16,800. And then we take the other one, which we saw is 22,400 times 3 divided by 12, 5,600. Yeah. And then we go back to the income statement. We continue looking for allowable expense. After repair and maintenance, there is rent and rates. Rent and rates. And this one uh, does not have additional information. So it's all about apportioning 9 over 12, 3 over 12 of uh, 244, 600. So 9 divided by 12 times 244, 600, which we have 183, 450. The other one would be 3 over 12, 61, 150. And then we continue after rent and rates, interest on loan. Interest on money borrowed we said is an allowable expense. So interest on loan, which we take again 9 over 12, 3 over 12. Of the interest on loan over loan is 166, 200. We minus, if you look at additional information number seven, we are told interest on loan include interest on partners capital of 100,000, which was shared according to the profit sharing ratio. So in here, there is interest on capital to the partners, which is not allowable, we said so. So we remain with the remaining 166 minus 200 minus 100,000, that will be 66,200. Then we apportion 9 divided by 12 times 66,200. Give us 49,650. The other one is the same. 3 over 12 of the same. 16,550. There. Then we continue. We go back to the income statement. After the interest on loan, we have general expenses. General expenses are allowable expenses. Nine over twelve, three over twelve of 
The overall general expense is 964,000. But we must minus, there is an additional information number six about the general expense, which we are told that it included registering of a patent right of 64,000. Patent right cost, we said, is not allowable. So that need to be minus 64,000. Also, flotation cost of 48,000. We said flotation cost is for the shares, and it is usually for the company. So this one, we have to remove it from here. Although we said it's allowable on the company, but the figure that we want to remain with is the one we are pushing, the one relating to the company and the partnership. This one needs to be taken to the partnership direct, I mean to the company directory. So we need to first of all remove it from here, 48,000. Also, there was an additional piece of, uh, cost of negotiating an additional piece of land for expansion, 56,000. That is also not allowable, a fixed asset. Then, the remaining one is the one that is going to be allowable. So we are going to take 964,000 and then we minus 64,000 and then we minus 48,000 and then we minus 56,000. You have 796,000. Then we take uh, the figure times 9 over 12. Mm -hmm. 796,000 times uh, 3 over 12, 199,000, deduct, deduct from there. Then we continue, after that, uh, there is the motor vehicle expenses. Motor vehicle expenses are allowable. Remember we say that it's not the motor vehicle costs. That's not a fixed asset. It's the cost of running the motor vehicle, like repair, fuel, and all that. So that is a rubber board expense. So motor vehicle expenses. Which we have 9 over 12, 3 over 12. This one does not have additional information about it. So it's all about using it the way it is, 840. So we will have 9 over 12 uh, times 840. That gives us 630. We also take the 3 over 12. That gives us 210. After that, we go back. Insurance. Insurance, we said, is also a rubber expense. It's a business expense. So, insurance expense, which we have again 9 over 12, 3 over 12. There is no additional information on insurance, which we have 156,000. So, we take 9 over 12 times 156. That gives us 117,000. And also the 3 over 12 of the same, 39,000. After that, we have preliminary expenses. We said preliminary expenses are expenses incurred before you start the business. All these expenses are not supposed to be allowable before you start preliminary, pre, before. We don't allow them, we said. The other one is director's fee. Director's fee is allowable, but it only relates to the limited company. That's what we said. Only company has directors. So director's fee, which we have 600,000. So the whole of it come here. The other one is audit fee. Audit fee is a rubber board expense and it cut across the board. It, it is for the partnership and the company. So audit fee. We have 9 over 12, 3 over 12 of 148,200. So we have 9 over 12 
of 148-200. That give us 111-150. The other one is for the three months. 37 0, 50. After that, we have the debenture interest. We say debenture interest is allowable and only a company can issue debentures. So, for the company, allowable for the company, debenture interest. We have 360,000. The next one is traveling expenses. So, traveling expenses is usually an allowable expense. So, we'll have it here. And it cut across the board. So, 9 over 12 and 3 over 12 of the travel. So, there, I'm Patrick Amaukamure. And I'm the one who is taking you through the advanced taxation. Where I continue teaching you about the taxation of the businesses. And so far, we have been able to look at the partnership, which we said it consists of two areas. The admission and retirement of a partner during the year and also the conversion of a partnership into a limited company. Once we are done with that, then we go to the taxation of the limited company. Now, we have been able to look at the uh, questions about the admission and retirement of a partner during the year and also the conversion. But in the conversion, uh, we were able to only look at uh, one side of determining the taxable income. That is when you are required to use the net profit method. So how about in case where you are required to use the gross profit method? How do you about, uh, go about it? So I want us to look at a question concerning that. This question comes from uh, November. Twenty fifteen, question number three. And I want us to go through it. This is what the question says. James and Katana established a partnership business, sharing profits and losses in the ratio of three to respectively. The following is the income statement of the partnership for the year ending that 1st December 2014. We have the sales consisting of an DRI's foreign exchange gain, a capital gain on sale of shares, recovery from insurance on stock stolen, goods transferred to a branch at cost, dividend from Cali Cooperative Society, and total incomes. Then rest expenses which you have purchases, purchase of computers, partner salary, Legal fee, repair and maintenance, rent and rent, interest on loan, general expenses, motor vehicle expenses, insurance, preliminary expenses, director's fee, audit fees, debenture interest, traveling expenses, and net loss. Additional information number one, the partnership was converted into a limited liability company by the name Kaka Limited on 1st October 2014. Incomes and expenses accrued evenly throughout the year unless otherwise stated. Uh, number two, purchases and sales were inclusive of VAT at the rate of 16%. Closing stock was valued at 1840000 while opening stock was at 10000 of the sales. Net of value added tax. Number four, legal fee complied uh, petition to association of manufacturers, notice for change of business name, conveyance fee for business premise, stamp duty, negotiating a business loan, recovery of bad debts, signing a 100-year lease agreement. Purchase of partners' private residence by James appear against tax alias. Number five, repair and maintenance complied. Purchase of furniture, installation of neon sign, designing of an office block, cost of partitioning office block, repainting of the business premises. Number six, general expenses included registering of patent rights 64,000, flotation costs of 48,000, and negotiating costs for an additional piece of land for business expansion at 56,000. Number seven, interest on loan include interest on partners' capital of shillings 100,000, which was shared according to the profit and all sharing ratio. Required, one, a statement of adjusted taxable profit or loss for the business for the year ending that 1st December 2014. Hint, start with gross profit. B, comment on the tax position of James, Katana, and the company. C, uh, citing examples, advise James Katana on two areas of tax avoidance that they could explore 
for the business. So, we can see in this question, we are required, number one, to get the statement of adjusted taxable profit loss of the business. Now, in this case, you take note that um, there is a conversion. A partnership business that was existing was converted into a limited company as per additional information number one. And from the additional information number one, we can see the partnership business lasted for a period of nine months and then the limited company three months because the conversion happened on 1st October 2014 and the year of income is ending on 31st of December 2014. So how do we go about getting the taxable income? Remember we say that conversion, we always use the gross profit method unless it is stated otherwise. Now here it is hinted that hint we start with the gross profit. Although they have hinted, they don't have to hint. Even if they haven't hint, hinted, we are supposed to use the gross profit method. When they say you start with gross profit, they mean that gross profit become one of your first income. And that does not mean that you look for gross profit somewhere and then you transfer here. No. What you do, you have to post the sales. The cost of sales, you get the gross profit. And then you continue from there. Uh, another thing that we said about the conversion is we must be able to separate the two business, the period of the partnership and the period of the limited company because these are two different businesses. So when we are taxing them, we tax them separately and differently. So here we start. So as we have noted, the partnership lasted for a period of nine months in that year and the limited company three months in that year. So here we are using the gross profit method. So we start with the sales. We'll start with the sales. So we take nine over 12, three over 12 of the sales figure given is 67, 28,000. But there's something that we are told about this uh, sales. If you look at additional information number two, we are told that the purchases and sales were inclusive of VAT at the rate of 16% where applicable. So that means this sales has VAT. So this sales is at 116%. Remember when you are getting the taxable income, VAT should not be factored in anywhere. So if they have the VAT, we need to remove the VAT. So we want to get the sales without VAT. So if this is 116%, we must be willing to get the 100. So take note that we are not interested in the VAT, the 16%. No, we want the cost without VAT, the 100. So if this is 116, 100 will be what? Cross multiply, it will mean that you multiply by 100 over 116. So... 67, 28,000 times 100 divided by 116. And then this we get is 5,800. And then we take times 9 over 12. That gives us 4350. And this other one is going to be 5,800. Times 3 over 12, which we get 1450. Now, gross profit method after getting the sales, we normally less the cost of sales. For the cost of sales, we normally start with the opening stock, of which case in this question, the opening stock we are told in additional information number 3. Closing stock was valued at 18.40, while opening stock was 10% of sales, net of VAT. So the opening stock is 10% of the sales, net of VAT. The sales that is net of VAT does not have the VAT, it's 5,800,000. 5, so you take times 5, 800. That translates to 580,000. And then we add the purchases. The purchases is in the income statement, the first expense actually, 
2842 so plus 28 but we are told this one as well in additional information number two it had the VAT so we must exclude the VAT we do the same we did with the sales so times a hundred of 116 let us get how much that is so 2842 a uh, thousand times a hundred divided by one sixteen give us twenty four fifty thousand and then we less the closing stock. The closing stock is given in point three additional information number three. Closing stock was valued at eighteen forty. So minus eighteen forty thousand. And then also remember we say that we also deduct any item that reduced the stock during the year. Do we have it? Yes. If you go to the incomes, among the incomes in the income statement, there is sales and realized foreign exchange gain, capital gain, recovery from insurance on stock stolen. It is telling you that there were stock that were stolen. So if they were stolen, this must be deducted from here. The stolen stock was 480. Minus 480. We also have the uh, goods transfer to the branch at cost. That, remember, you are just transferring goods from one place of the business to another, from the head office to the branch. There is no impact in addition to that. Because the stocks are still within the company, the branch and the head office are one and the same thing. And there is no other item that affected the cost of goods. So we cross. And then we apportion. Don't forget to apportion. We want the nine months. So nine over 12. The other one, three over 12. So we are going to have the 580,000 uh, plus 2450,000 and then minus 1840,000 and then we minus 480,000. That gives us 710 and then we multiply by 9. Divide by 12. Five thirty two five hundred. And then the other one is going to be seven ten times three over twelve. That gives us one seventy seven five hundred. Mm -hmm. So, after that, we can now get the gross profit. Gross profit will be sales minus the cost of sales, in which case we have 43,50,000 minus 532, 500, which give us 3817, 3817, uh, 500. This other one is 1450,000 minus 177, 500, give us 1272. Uh, 500 now that is the gross profit and then we said once you get the gross profit you normally add other taxable so we need to go through the question determine if they are taxable operating from operation now, the incomes are in the income statement after the sales, where we have unrealized foreign exit gain. Unrealized foreign exit gain, we said we don't usually tax. We only tax the realized or if it is silent, just realize uh, foreign exchange gain. The other one is capital gain on sale of shares. Shares are investment, so not operating. Recovery from insurance on stock stolen. 
we say that, that income from uh, compensation from the insurance company for stock stolen, that is supposed to be a taxable income. So, we come here, insurance compensation. We have 9 over 12, 3 over 12, of 480. Mm -hmm. So we have 9 divided by 12 times 480,000. That gives us 360. The other one is 3 over 12 of the same, 120. Mm -hmm. We continue. After the recovery from insurance on stock stolen in the income statement, there is goods transferred to a branch. That is not a sale. You are just moving your goods from one place of the business to another, from the head office to the branch. Nothing. Dividend from carry cooperative. That's an investment income. Here we want only the operating. After that, we have the expenses. Maybe in the additional information, you need to confirm with additional information to confirm whether you have an income. But if you look at all of them from number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, there is no income whatsoever. So meaning, we can now less. So, we need to go through the whole question again. And especially in the income statement where expenses start. Any allowable expense, we deduct here. And the first expense is purchases. Now, purchases we use to get the cost of sales. So it's already considered there. The other one is purchase of computer. Computer is not an allowable expense. It's a fixed asset. What we allow for computer is the way and tier. And because here we are looking at allowable expense now, way and tier should be deducted. So way and tier on computers. We take 9 over 12, 3 over 12 of 25% of 130, um, 180. So 25% of 180, that gives us 45 times 9 divided by 12. Give us 33, 750. The other one is 3 divided by 12 times 45,000. That gives us 11 to 50. Yeah. So we continue. So the next expense in line is the partner's salaries. But we said partner salary is not allowable. It's for the partnership and it's not allowed. The other one is legal fee. Legal fee we said is usually allowable unless it, is, it has additional information. It is explained further, which is the case in here. If you look at the point number four, it is saying legal fee complies petition to association of manufacturer and the rest. So what you need to do, you, may, you need to post one figure here because we are, to me, we are to using the gross profit method now. You post another allowable expense is the legal fee. So you take 9 over 12, 3 over 12 of the legal expense is 680. Minus, because you want to remain with the expense that is allowable of the legal, just minus the non-allowables, the one that are not supposed to be allowable. In additional information number four, we are told, legal fee complies of petition to association of manufacturers. We had said anything paid to the trade association is allowable. Association of manufacturers, that is supposed to be an allowable expense. Then notice for change of business name. Now we said that for an expense to be allowable, it must be income generating. This one change of business name has nothing to do with the income generation. We don't allow that. So minus 64,800. Then... We have the conveyance fee for business premises. We said conveyance fee is the legal cost to transfer a fixed asset. And we don't usually allow it. So we minus 72, 400. Again, stamp duty. Stamp duty is a form of tax. Taxes are usually not allowable. 
we said that. So we minus uh, 36,600. The other one is negotiating a business loan. We had said legal cost relating to loan, bonds and debentures are not allowed. So this one is not, so 2,800. The other one is recovery of bad debts. Recovery of bad debt, we said, is usually allowable. We said any legal cost relating to debtors and customer allowed. Then signing a 100-year lease agreement. We say that the lease up to 99 years is the one that we allow legal cost. Any above that, we don't. So this is not allowable. 128, 400. After that, we have the purchase of the partner's private residence. We had said that any expense relating to the partners, we don't allow. This for private, for the partners, we don't allow. 150. The other one is appeal against tax arrears. We had said any expense relating to tax, we don't allow. So this one is not. So minus 82. Then we cross. So whatever remains there become the allowable legal costs, which we now we apportion. So it is going to be 680,000, uh, the overall legal cost minus the non allowable 64,800, minus 72,400, minus 36,600, minus 2,800, minus 128,400. And then we minus 150,000. And then we minus 82,000. That gives us 125,000. Then we take times 9 divided by 12. And 3,750. The other one we say 3 divided by 12 of 125,000. That gives us 31 to 50. Uh -huh. Then we continue. We go back to the income statement and continue looking for allowable expenses. After that, there is repair and maintenance. Repair and maintenance is allowable expense. However, there is a point number five about it. If there is something mentioning that item, go check. So that you determine if there are some parts which are not allowed, you remove them. Like it includes purchase of furniture. That's a fixed asset. Fixed asset we claim we enter capital allowance for furniture. Installation of neon sign, that's supposed to be we enter. A designing of an office block, that's a fixed asset. That requires IBD office block. Cost of partitioning office block, we enter to ten percent. Repainting of the business premise, that is now the allowable. So we have repair. So we take nine over twelve. 3 over 12 of the overall 568,400. Remove the boss like furniture 96,000. The other one is neon sign 60. You have the office block 140. You have the partitioning 250 that so we have 568 uh, 400 minus 96,000 minus 60,000 minus 140,000 and then we minus 250,000 so that give us 22,400 and you can take note that uh, the only expense that is allowable in number five is repair of business premise. So if you remove all the others which are not allowable, you still remain with that, the 22,400. So you can as well pick that and call it repair and maintenance and then you post it there. So we times by nine, divide by 12, which you have 16,800. And then we take the other one, which we saw is 22,400. Times 3 divided by 12, 5,600. Yeah. 
and then we go back to the income statement we continue looking for allowable expense after repair and maintenance there is rent and rates rent and rates and this one uh, does not have additional information so it's all about apportioning 9 over 12 3 over 12 of uh, 244 600 So 9 divided by 12 times 244 600, which we have 183 450. The other one would be 3 over 12, 61 150. And then we continue after rent and rates. Interest on loan. Interest on money borrowed we said is allowable expense. So interest on loan, which we take again 9 over 12, 3 over 12, of the interest on loan over loan is 166, 200. We minus, if you look at additional information number 7, we are told interest on loan include interest on partners capital of 100,000 which was shared according to the profit sharing ratio. So, in here, there is interest on capital to the partners, which is not allowable, we said so. So, we remain with the remaining 166 minus 200 minus 100,000. That will be 66,200. Then we apportion 9 divided by 12 times 66,200. Give us 49,650. The other one is the same. 3 over 12 of the same, 16,550. There. Then we continue, we go back to the income statement. After the interest on loan, we have general expenses. General expenses are allowable expenses. Nine over 12, 3 over 12 of... The overall general expense is 964000 But we must minus, there is an additional information number 6 about the general expense, which we are told that it included registering of a patent right of 64000 Patent right cost, we said, is not allowable. So that needs to be minus 64000 Also, flotation cost of 48000 we said flotation cost is for the shares and it is usually for the company. So this one we have to remove it from here. Although we said it's allowable on the company, but the figure that we want to remain with is the one we apportion, the one relating to the company and the partnership. This one needs to be taken to the partnership direct, I mean to the company directory. So we need to first of all remove it from here, 48,000. Also, there was an additional piece of uh, cost of negotiating an additional piece of land for expansion, 56,000. That is also not allowable, a fixed asset. Then, the remaining one is the one that is going to be allowable. So we are going to take 964,000 and then we minus 64,000 and then we minus 48,000 and then we minus 56,000 you have 796,000. Then we take uh, the figure times 9 over 12. Mm -hmm. 796,000 times uh, 3 over 12. 199,000. Deduct, deduct from there. Then we continue. After that, uh, there is the motor vehicle expenses. Motor vehicle expenses are, are allowable. Remember we say that it's not the motor vehicle costs. That's not a fixed. It's the cost of running the motor vehicle, like repair, fuel, and all that. So that is allowable expense. So motor vehicle expenses... which we have 9 over 12, 3 over 12.
this one does not have additional information about it so it's all about using it the way it is 840 so we will have 9 over 12 uh, times 840 that gives us 630 we also take the 3 over 12 that gives us 210. After that, we go back. Insurance. Insurance, we said, is also a rubber expense. It's a business expense. So, insurance expense. Which we have again 9 over 12. 3 over 12. There is no additional information on insurance. Which we have 156,000. So we take 9 over 12 times 156. That gives us 117,000. And also the 3 over 12 of the same, 39,000. After that, we have preliminary expenses. We say it. Preliminary expenses are expenses incurred before you start the business. All these expenses are not supposed to be allowable. Before you start preliminary, pre, before, we don't allow them, we said. The other one is director's fee. Director's fee is allowable, but it is only related to the limited company. That's what we said. Only company has directors. So director's fee, which we have 600,000. So the whole of it come here. The other one is audit fee. Audit fee is a rubber board expense and it cut across the board. It, it is for the partnership and the company. So audit fee. We have 9 over 12. 3 over 12. Of 148,200. So we have 9 over 12. Of 148,200. That gives us 111, 150. The other one is for the three months. That is 7, 0, 50. After that, we have the debenture interest. We say debenture interest is allowable and only a company can issue debentures. So for the company, allowable for the company, debenture interest. We have the 60,000. The next one is traveling expenses. So, traveling expenses is usually an allowable expense. So, we'll have it here. And it cut across the board. So, 9 over 12 and 3 over 12. Of the traveling, 96,000. So, we we'll have 3 over 12 times 96,000. That will give us 24,000 here. Uh, now this is supposed to be for this. 24,000 is for the company. And for the partnership, it is going to be 9 over 12, 72,000. When we get to the end of that, it's kind of we are done with the expenses. But we need to go through the additional information for an expense that is not in the PNL and it's allowable. The one not in the PNL. So we go to the additional information. Number one, the partnership was converted into a limited liability company by the name Kaka Limited on 1st October 2014. Incomes and expenses accrued even day throughout the year unless otherwise stated. There is no expense there. So we go to number two. Purchases and sales were inclusive of VAT at the rate of 16%. There is no expense there. Then number three, closing stock was valued at 18.40, while opening stock was at 10% of sales, net of VAT. There is no expense. Number four, legal expense. Now, legal expense is already in the PNL, 
and we consider the part that is allowable by removing the non-allowable part. And in the same place, we have not seen any fixed asset that we can claim capital allowance among all those ones. There is none that is a fixed asset. So we go to number five, repair and maintenance complies. So we had seen that the repair and maintenance is allowable. However, we remove the ones that are not allowable. However, we noted that most of those items, actually all the items in repair, were fixed assets. So we don't allow fixed assets, that's why we remove them, but now we claim the wear and tear. So we claim wear and tear for furniture and fitting, which is supposed to be 9 over 12, 3 over 12 of 10% of the furniture cost 96,000. So we take 10% of 96,000, that gives us 9,600, then we multiply by 9, divide by 12, 7, 2, and then we do the same, uh, 3, divide by 12 times 9, 600, give us 2,400. So another fixed asset in point number five is installation of neon sign. That require wear and tear as well. So wear and tear allowance on neon sign, which we are supposed to have again 9 over 12, 3 over 12 of 